On the seashore, between high and low tides, lies the intertidal zone, where the ocean meets the land. It's underwater during high tide, and when the tide is out, it's exposed to wind, rain, and the scorching sun. Natural selection and the process of evolution that it drives is unceasing. Only the most tenacious creatures can adapt in an unpredictable and ever-changing world. On Earth, evolution, meaning life itself, began in the ocean. A horse. A cow. A donkey. And a deer. When placed on the full timeline of life, Pear David's deer emerged very recently. Like humans, they appeared in the present Quaternary period, which began 2.6 million years ago. 10,000 years ago, an estimated 100 million of them roamed the marshes and plains of China. But 7,000 years after that, their numbers began to decline until the species was declared extinct in China at the beginning of the 20th century. Only a dozen or so were left living because they'd been shipped to zoos in Europe. Fortunately, a breeding population was established in England. In 1986, 39 Pear David's deer were reintroduced to the Yellow Sea coast the place where the last one of them living in the wild had disappeared. Spring is coming, although the weather has yet to warm up. For male deer, this season is the best. They shed their antlers each winter. By now, a new pair has regrown. Before they're fully formed and hardened, they take extra care of them. The males do not fight, because they can't afford to do so. Instead of fighting, comparing sizes serves as a proxy. Now the top priority for males is to build strength by running and swimming, getting ready for the new breeding season. Pear David's deer are native to wetlands. The floodplains between the Yellow and Yangtze rivers are where they evolve. Their broad hooves and strong dew claws allow them to move easily through marshlands, while webbed toes make them able swimmers. With their long tails, they can drive away mosquitoes. Their long snouts, meanwhile, enable them to reach food under shallow water. A unique feature is their antlers. 
which have no forward-facing points, only branches extending backwards. Pear David's deer are one of the gentlest species of deer. A new sub-branch grows on their antlers each year. Deer of the same age come together to test their antlers. They may well be half-brothers. Soon, however, they will be rivals. In June, the mysterious scent of females is growing more intense. The males cover themselves in mud like a coat of armor. Like knights, they will now compete for the favor of females. This male is looking to take first mover advantage. Although the females have not yet come into heat, he's already rounded up a large flock. He drives other males away ceaselessly to expand his harem, neither eating nor sleeping. Some powerful bachelors are waiting on the sidelines. Young and robust, they're ready to exploit or create opportunities. This young buck has adorned his antlers with a fishing net. The male on guard can sense his ambition. A contest is fast approaching. They move away from the crowd and move around each other, each one sizing up the other's strength one circle. Another circle. And then a third one. Different from the fighting between greenhorns, the duel between the two strong males takes place with ceremony. With patience guiding their strength, they're focusing on how to achieve a swift and conclusive victory. Each of the males tries to push the other backwards. Initially, it's not clear who's stronger. After a while, however, the outcome is obvious. The battle ends with the challenger in retreat. With the breeding season not yet here, now it is not the time to go all out. He will come back when the incumbent has worn himself down. No males are willing to forego their chance to mate. They know there is no permanent king. With antlers symbolizing their status, making them as imposing as possible is crucial. Before the real fighting begins, a dressing up contest of sorts is taking place. More and more fawns have grown up. More does are on heat and more bucks are ready to fight. With China's population of reintroduced Pear David's deer now standing at over 6,000, perhaps this will be the fiercest mating season in recent times. Yellow Sea wetland in Yenchung, Jiangsu, is the largest coastal wetland of the Asian continent bordering the Pacific. 
Every day, the receding tide leaves behind intriguing patterns. Tidal waves from the sea collide with sediment carried down by the incoming Yellow River. The sediment settles as the tide rises and falls, pushing the coastline seaward at a rate of 200 meters per year. Millions of migratory birds stop, molt and winter here. Along this ever-growing coastal corridor, Pear David's deer are expanding their territory and multiplying. In just 35 years, the species that was once extinct in China has firmly re-established itself. Surging waves coming in from the vast ocean enter the bay and push on landwards. As they reach the shore, their rising and falling engulfs young mangroves. This area belongs neither to land nor ocean. When the tide floods the beach, it becomes an underwater world. When the tide recedes, the land underneath the mangroves comes into view. With its routine synchronized with the rising and falling tide, a horned ghost crab is waiting on the beach. Although it breathes through gills, the crab is almost a terrestrial creature. It has a way of keeping its gills moist when the tide is out, to prevent them from drying out. It burrows down into the sand, where it hides during the day. Unless... This is a female crab carrying a large clump of her own eggs. Standing with one side facing incoming tide, she's ready to meet the sea. The tide is coming and she moves towards the water. Not every wave will be gentle to her. She rushes towards the tide for a second time. It's a back and forth process during which she's exposed to the water from every angle. The female horned ghost crab seems to embrace but also fear the sea. There is a reason for her conflicted behavior, to facilitate the hatching of her eggs. Between the high and low tide lines is a cruel world which is constantly buffeted by waves and shifting sand.
On the night of a full moon, the tide rises higher than usual, which brings a change to the beach. Once the tide has stopped rising, the horned ghost crab starts a new day. If you see sand and burrows like this on the beach, a similar crustacean will surely be nearby. The waves have just started receding, but the little creature is already hard at work. The larvae of horned ghost crabs are plankton that live in the sea and molt several times before metamorphosing and returning to land. Young horned ghost crabs always stay close to the sea. This crab uses its pincer to tamp down the sand at the entrance to its burrow to prevent it from collapse. Now it can rest assured. Although it lives in sand, it's not comfortable being covered in it. It steadies itself and adopts an impact-resistant posture to rinse. The tide seems to be becoming more gentle. An adult male crab with long horns on its eye stalks is looking for a suitable place to dig a burrow. The burrow should be at a certain distance away from the low tide line to be sure of remaining intact. The little horned ghost crab keeps on digging. To build a home for itself after the sea recedes, it must dig every night, like Sisyphus taking on his never-ending task. But it will always succeed in the end. And when it grows up, it will become a strong player on this beach. The female crab stands at the edge of the tide line, embracing the tide on the night of the full moon. The rising tide, she hopes, will carry her offspring further. This is a coral island. The warm waters surrounding it are the ideal habitat for green sea turtles. Even today, the full life cycle of green sea turtles is incompletely understood. After hatching on land and entering the ocean, they simply disappear. From when they're four or five centimeters long to 20 to 30 centimeters, their lost juvenile stage could be as long as 20 years. During this time, they may have traveled thousands of kilometers to appear on the other side of an ocean. Every adult sea turtle has survived numerous trials and hardships, and each of them is also a great navigator. Only about one in a thousand infant turtles end up making it to their foraging grounds to complete their life cycles. Unlike fish or crabs, turtles have to surface periodically to breathe. With ancestors in prehistory that evolved on dry land, they still use lungs to absorb oxygen. One theory of why the ancestors of modern turtles took to the water is that they did so to escape from dinosaurs. Although they live in the ocean for nearly their entire lives, they always find their way back to the beach where they were born to lay their eggs. In some documented cases, sea turtles have lived for as long as 150 years. Their diet varies between species, and some species change their eating habits as they age. Today, however, there's something more important for this turtle to do than eating.
Coral reefs are built from the hard calcium carbonate secretions of tiny creatures called coral polyps over thousands of years. Related to anemones or jellyfish, individual polyps are only a few millimeters in diameter. But the reefs created by them are the largest structures built by living organisms. Often oddly shaped, they support about a quarter of all marine life. The green sea turtle is looking for a crevice under a reef that is just right for its purpose. The hard meter-long shell on its back gives it thorough protection. But it can also be a lot of trouble. All kinds of dirt attaches to it. Algae and parasites make the shell their breeding ground. Barnacles, once affixed, can take a free ride. The larvae of barnacles float in water. After they've settled down somewhere, it's hard to remove them. This young turtle wants to get rid of its uninvited guests. It does so by rubbing its shell against the coral. Then it turns around to continue until most of the accumulated dirt on its back has been removed. Rubbing is not the full solution to its problem. To complete the cleaning process, it needs help. It swims over to a huge rock where many small fish live. They give it a hearty welcome for the breakfast it's brought to them. Together, they have an unspoken agreement with the reptile for mutual benefit. In this area of the ocean, the green sea turtle has no predators and would normally be living a carefree life. Recently, however, the reef has been changing. Last year, many reefs became bleached or died because of high water temperatures. This summer seems to be just as hot. Coral bleaching is a sure sign of deteriorating water environment. It happens when the temperature of seawater exceeds 29 degrees Celsius. If bleaching lasts for six weeks, corals will die. Once they lose vitality, water weeds and algae become attached to them, preventing them from continuing to grow. Fortunately, sea turtles can offer some help. Green sea turtles eat algae and seaweed, which can often be found growing on coral reefs. The chlorophyll in their diet gives them greenish-colored fat. That's why they're called green sea turtles. But climate change is also threatening the future of green sea turtles. The gender of a sea turtle is related to the temperature. If turtle eggs are incubated at above 30.3 degrees Celsius, the hatchlings will be all female. The ocean where life began is facing challenges along with all life on Earth. Huichou Island, China's youngest volcanic island, was shaped into what it is today by its last eruption 7,000 years ago. 
People who travel there are often delighted and surprised to find that it has some very special visitors. Brides Wales. Fifty million years ago, the ancestors of whales, who were land vertebrates, returned to the sea. Over their long evolution since then, their bodies slowly became streamlined, their limbs evolved into fins, and they grew larger. Even today, they belong to the order of Artiodactyla. They've learned how to dive to the bottom of the sea, but they still need to surface to breathe. They swim in the ocean like fish, but are actually the closest cousins of the hippopotamus. Bride's whales seldom reveal themselves. Their species was not identified until the last century. Although those who are willing to travel with enough patience can encounter them. Gathering gulls are a telltale sign of a surfacing bride's whale. Whales are approaching from different directions. They appear to be hunting and the gulls are becoming more excited. The bride's whales are in fact setting up a trap to catch fish. As baleen whales, they don't take the effort to chase large fish. Instead, they open their enlarged mouth and swallow seawater containing their prey, be they schools of fish, shrimps or plankton. From the throat down to the abdomen, the accordion-like folds on their body expand instantly, like a bottomless pit. Once inside, the prey are sieved out of the water by keratinaceous baleen plates. To hunt, bride's whales coordinate their movements to round up schools of fish and start feeding when the water is dense with them. Adult bride's whales are more than 12 meters long and weigh nearly 20 tons. In one day, a single adult can eat an estimated 650 kilos of fish. This is the only place off China's coast where you can meet whales. Every September, bride's whales appear on the sea around Weizhou Island, where they will spend the following eight months. Where do they come from? Where, indeed, are they born? Here's a calf, closely following its mother. The period over which bride's whales give milk to their young is normally around six months. As to where they breed and the migratory routes they take, scientists who study them still don't have an answer. There are around four dozen bride's whales in the sea near Weizhou Island. Given their vast appetite, are there enough fish for them? Bay Bu Gulf, where Weizhou Island lies, is the largest bay in China. Below it is the Chinese continental shelf, 
with an average water depth of 46 meters. And it enjoys sufficient sunlight. Abundant phytoplankton give the water here a green color. The eastern entrance to the Gulf is the Chungjo Strait, which is an important channel for substance exchange. Nutrient-rich land water coming in through the strait blends with seawater from the South China Sea. It drives a counterclockwise circulation in the north of Bebo Gulf, bringing vitality to this area. In short, this is one of the most productive areas of the ocean. Bride's whales probably followed fish here long before humans arrived. Whales swallow a huge amount of food and return nutrients through their excreta, boosting the growth of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, in turn, are major producers of oxygen on Earth and provide organic matter for the organisms that comprise the vast majority of marine life. Each whale, therefore, is a mobile ecosystem and nutrient carrier in the ocean. Their destiny is closely linked to that of humans. The rainy season is coming and bride's whales will soon leave. When they return, perhaps they will bring new calves. The bay too is looking forward to the arrival of new lives. These floating leaves on the surface of the water, full of thorns, are known as prickly water lilies. One bird is dainty enough to live on these leaves, the pheasant-tailed jacana. Its long, thin toes and claws enable it to avoid the thorns. More importantly, they disperse its weight so that it can walk lightly over the floating vegetation. This male jacana is a good father. His partner left after laying four eggs. Pear-shaped, with one end rounded and large and the other pointed, they do not easily roll off. The male takes on the responsibility of incubation and rearing the young. Instead of building a nest, his bosom provides the eggs with more than enough warmth and protection. What should be a moment of quiet caring, unfortunately, is shattered by the arrival of a whiskered tern. During the breeding season, the whiskered tern grows a cap of black feathers, which makes it look more imposing. In flight, it's among the fastest birds. Seeing the invader, the father, Jakana, calls his babies to hide under his wings. The male jacana is much larger than the whiskered tern, but not as aggressive. He only wants to protect his children. Whiskered terns can be ruthless and violent. They steal material from neighbors' nests and bully young birds without parents. They've been known to kill infants that stray into their territory. They can start a fight at any time.
The area where the prickly water lilies are growing was once part of the ocean, but then became a lagoon after the sea receded. As the distance to the ocean grew, it evolved into a freshwater lake. Seeds of prickly water lilies float in the water here, before taking root and multiplying each year. Too many leaves will reduce the oxygen in the lagoon. Luckily, nature has a way of regulating this. The water lilies grow only in one of its corners to cover an area of a few hundred square meters. This is where pheasant-tailed jacanas and whiskered terns raise their families. At only two days old, this tern fledgling finds its water lily home, has floated away like a small boat. It's now surrounded by duckweed and must swim to a safe place on its own. From the air, one of its parents urges it to make up its mind. Terrified, the fledgling jumps into the water. This is the first time it's swum. It uses all its strength, but given the density of the duckweed, progress is slow. The infant turn is still struggling. The first lesson to learn in life is that there are always some things you have to do on your own. One of its parents tries to guide it to a transfer area. The first step will be to reach there. From the air, the adult bird urges it on until it begins to swim in the right direction. Exhausted, it stops to rest among the weeds. Its parents will not desert it, but they can't offer it physical help either. The turn chick resumes its journey. It makes it to solid ground. But this is not the final destination. Its parents continue to guide it. Bearing desperate hunger, it has to move forward. The adults continue to give encouragement. It's almost there. Finally, it makes it, completing the first adventure of its young life. Equipped with outsized feet, Jakarna chicks are able to walk as soon as they're born. All the father needs to do is accompany them. Now they're tired and must rest. The father has to find a stable place. Not here. The water is too deep. This is it. Can they make it? One chick appears to be floundering. Soggy with water, the warm shelter offered by their father has enormous appeal. There's just enough room for the four chicks to squeeze in together. Now, they can have a good sleep.
The interface between land and sea is one of the most fluctuating environments on Earth, but mangroves have adapted. Their long stilt-like roots allow them to remain above the rising and falling tide. As the sea subsides, it reveals a new world. The mud and silt underneath the mangroves is exposed, and a multitude of creatures emerge. In the world of fiddler crabs, the winner takes all. The males of the species have a single, lopsided, enlarged pincer. To smaller females, it signals their fitness as a mate. Another male with a bigger claw surfaces and approaches. Before long, a crab melee has kicked off. The defending crab's legs are shaking from standing for too long, but he stood his ground and defended his burrow. With the day now well advanced, the beach is heating up. Its inhabitants have no time to lose. The tide activates the beach. It takes nutrients from the land and gives back plankton in return. Tiny creatures live in the sand, just as fish live in the ocean. Organic debris from the mangroves enriches the soil. Inhabitants from underground are on the move. Female fiddler crabs have two symmetrical pincers, like a pair of delicate tweezers. They use them to chew mud, sifting it for food with their mouthparts. Male crabs only have one small pincer, so they take twice as long to feed, and they have other important work to do. This male crab needs to renovate his burrow, into which he hopes to attract females for mating. He pushes old mud out and then brings fresh mud in. He uses his pincer to measure the width of the burrow. It has to be strong enough to withstand the tide and offer shelter from sunlight to breed in. A male fiddler's crab's most important possession is his burrow. In digging burrows, crabs aerate the soil, which benefits the mangrove forest. The male must always be on alert for intruders. Digging and holding burrows is not easy. He guards the entrance, unwilling to leave. He has no friends here. Every other male crab is a potential enemy. Sure enough, an invader arrives. It directly resorts to force to try to drive the owner away. Now the burrow that the young male crab worked so hard to dig has been occupied. He has to fight to defend his territory. He will fight until the end to take back his home. A female crab is close by, but the two males are much too occupied to attend to her.
One way the fight can end is with one crab being lifted into the air. The battle continues with high intensity. The crab that loses will forego the chance to mate. With higher incoming waves, the tide is now rising. When water floods the mudflats and approaches the mangroves, fiddler crabs know it's time to turn in. They have a reliable internal clock. Experts have remarked on their ability to act ahead of incoming water and often refer to them as tidal crabs. Before water submerges them, they will have sealed themselves in their burrows. First, the crab needs to make a roof for its home. It piles up large clods of mud at the entrance and finally closes it with a last piece. This crab's burrow is too close to the water. It must finish the job quickly. By the time the water rises, every crab is safe inside its home. See you tomorrow.